Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sangeeta Chaudhuri again and in my today's lecture I am going to discuss about hypernatremia which is very important from clinical point of view. In my class I am going to discuss about the causes of hypernatremia and the approach to a patient presenting with hypernatremia, how do we diagnose and treat a case of hypernatremia. So let's see what is hypernatremia actually. Once the serum sodium goes above 145 milliequivalent per liter, we know the condition as hypernatremia. The normal value of serum sodium is 135 to 145 milliequivalent per liter. And when it is more than 145, we call it as hypernatremia. The main etiology or the cause of hypernatremia is usually a primary sodium gain, which is less common. And the other one is water deficit, which is very much common cause of hypernatremia. Now, if the thirst mechanism and the concentrating ability of kidney remains intact, hypernatremia is less likely. So, there has to be impairment of thirst mechanism or else impairment of the urinary concentrating ability of the kidney to cause hypernatremia or for the persistence of hypernatremia. Otherwise, these intact compensatory mechanism will result in resolution of hypernatremia. So, what are the symptoms of hypernatremia? The symptoms are mainly neurological. There may be altered mental status, weakness, neuromuscular irritability. Patient may present with focal neurological deficit. Patient may have seizure or may even present in coma. If we talk about the investigations, there are a few things which we need to know to classify the hypernatremia as well as to know the different causes of hypernatremia. So first of all, we need to know about the urine osmolality and then we need to know the daily solute excretion. The daily solute excretion can be calculated by the easy formula that is urine osmolality multiplied by 24 hour urine volume. And one more thing we need to know the response of desmopressin acetate. Okay, and this is important to differentiate causes of hypernatremia, renal, certain renal causes of hypernatremia. Now, if I talk about the diagnostic approach, I'm going to discuss the following flow chart, which will be very much easy for us to understand the causes of hypernatremia, the classification of hypernatremia, as well as the different causes. How do we identify the cause of hypernatremia? Because only when we can identify the underlying cause of hypernatremia, we can treat the disease. Now, first of all, we need to look at the extracellular fluid volume. Extracellular fluid volume, if there is hypervolemia, okay, that means there may be two reasons, okay. The first one may be a primary sodium gain due to hypertonic sodium load or repeated use of hypertonic sodium infusion or a primary gain may be due to mineralocorticoid excess, Okay, now mineralocorticoid excess may be because of hyperallosteronism or Cushing syndrome. Okay, so this is about hypervolemic hypernatremia. Now, if the extracellular fluid volume is low or if there is euvolemia, that means if it is a hypovolemic or euvolemic hypernatremia, then we need to look at the urine volume. Normally what happens when there is hypovolemic or euvolemic hypernatremia, the kidney will try to excrete a small amount of maximally concentrated urine. So here comes the role of urine volume and osmolality. So in case of hypo or euvolemic hyponatremia, we will look for urine volume per day. If the urine volume is less than 800 ml per day, and the urine osmolality is more than 100 milliosmol per liter that shows the urine is maximally concentrated with an urine sodium of less than 10 milliequivalent per liter. That means the causes of hypernatremia is uh, maybe due to insensible, insensible loss of water through maybe through respiratory tract or through skin or maybe GI loss. Okay. 
certain diarrheas osmotic diarrheas are very much uh, associated with hyponatremia and also specifically certain viral gastroenteritis also causes gi loss ultimately leading to hypernatremia now it may be due to primary hypodipsia also it shows that in these cases the renal mechanism of concentrating urine is intact again i am telling if the urine volume is less than 800 ml and the urine osmolality is more than 800 milli osmol per liter and urine sodium less than 10 that means the urine is maximally concentrated by the kidney and in that case the causes are not of renal cause the causes are insensible loss of water through maybe through skin or respiratory tract or maybe gi loss of water or maybe due to primary hypodipsia now if urine volume is more than 1000 ml we will check for urine osmolality again now if urine osmolality is less than 300 milli osmol per liter that shows the most probable cause is diabetes insipidus okay that's why the patient is passing dilute urine because the urinary concentrating ability of kidney is not there so that's why the patient is passing dilute urine and the probable reason is diabetes insipidus now diabetes insipidus can be of two types central diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus i'm going to discuss about the causes later on so to differentiate between central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus we need to do a test that is known as a uh, uh, response to desmopressin we need to see what we need to do we need to restrict the water and then we need to administer 10 microgram of desmopressin intranasally okay if it is a central diabetes insipidus then there will be increase in urine osmolality by 50% okay by 50% increase in urine osmolality okay and if it is a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus then there will be no response fine again i am telling if the urine osmolality is less than 300 milli osmol per liter that means the probable cause is diabetes insipidus now diabetes insipidus can be of two types central diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus now how to differentiate between these two for that reason we need to do a test that is known as response to desmopressin we need to administer 10 microgram of intranasal desmopressin after a careful water restriction and if the response is increase in urine osmolality by 50% that means it is a case of complete nephrogenic uh, sorry complete central diabetes insipidus and if there is no response okay the response is negative that means it is a case of complete nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and once we identify the cause of diabetes insipidus we are going to treat the patient accordingly okay now if urine osmolality is in between 300 to 800 milli osmol per liter in that case we need to calculate the urine solute excretion or solute load per day that i have already said how to calculate the urine solute excretion that will be uh, the uh, urine osmolality multiplied by 24 hour urinary volume okay so if the urine solute excretion is more than 900 milli osmols per day that means it is due to osmotic diuresis now osmotic diuresis may be due to increase in blood glucose level ultimately leading to glucosuria may be due to use of mannitol or maybe as a result of high solute load again i am telling if the urine osmolality is in between 300 to 800 milli osmol per liter then we need to calculate the urine solute load or urine solute excretion if the urine solute excretion is more than 900 milli osmols per day that means the reason can be due to osmotic diuresis and osmotic diuresis may be due to glucosuria use of mannitol and high solute load and if the solute load or urine solute excretion is less than 900 milli osmols per day 
it may be most probably due to a case of partial diabetes insipidus that may be a partial uh, uh, central diabetes insipidus or a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus again to differentiate we need to do a response to this more present test and if there is response then that means it is a case of cent partial central diabetes insipidus if there is no response then that means it is a case of partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus now look at the uh, just look at the cause of central diabetes insipidus the central diabetes insipidus is uh, it is due to the impairment of the neurohypophysis okay due to the impairment of neurohypophysis now what are the causes of impairment of neurohypophysis can be there it may be due to trauma to the neurohypophysis head injury it may be a post neurosurgery may be due to certain infection leading to neurohypophysitis it may be neoplastic uh, infiltration of the neurohypophysis it may be due to granulomatous disease or may be due to a vascular accident so these are the causes of central diabetes insipidus why we need to know the cause because the treatment of underlying condition leading to hypernatremia is very important and once we can treat the underlying cause of hypernatremia there will be resolution of the condition if you look at the causes of uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus nephrogenic diabetes insipidus uh, can be of uh, two variety it can be a inherited nephrogenic diabetes insipidus where there is a resistance to the function of vasopressin in case of central diabetes insipidus there is impairment in the release of vasopressin from the neurohypophysis whereas in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus there is a, a resistance of the uh, resistance to the function of vasopressin so it may be an inherited cause it may be an acquired cause acquired causes may be due to an intrinsic renal tubular disease it may be due to certain electrolyte imbalances like hypercalcemia and hypokalemia it may be due to drugs certain drugs like demiclocycline and photoresin this may lead to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus or may be use of loop diuretics so these are the causes of uh, diabetes insipidus both central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so this was about the diagnostic flow chart by which uh, uh, by knowing the extracellular fluid volume then urine volume then urine osmolality okay and urine solute excretion per day we need to or we'll be able to know the different causes of hypernatremia and identifying and it will be very easy to identify the specific cause for a particular patient. Now, if we talk about the treatment of hypernatremia, there are three important things. First of all, the rate of correction, then appropriate intervention and treatment of underlying cause. Rate of correction is very important because an overgelous uh, rate of correction will ultimately lead to cerebral edema and many neurological complications. So we need to be very careful with the rate of correction. Appropriate intervention, of course, the patient, sometimes the patient will require pharmacological treatment, sometimes the patient will require surgical intervention. Treatment of underlying cause is very, very important because it will ultimately cause the resolution of hypernatremia. Now, if it is a case of hypovolemic hypernatremia and if there is a mild volume depletion, then we may use half normal saline for infusion and if it is a severe volume depleted case then we will use isotonic solution 0.9 percent sodium chloride solution we will use until the patient is hemodynamically stable and once the patient is hemodynamically stable we can use hypotonic fluid to correct the water deficit now if it is a case of hypervolemic hypernatremia which is usually uh, rare which is due to primary sodium gain quite unusual if we can stop the iatrogenic sodium infusion, most of the time it will get corrected. Now, if you talk about the treatment of diabetes insipidus, for central diabetes insipidus, uh, the drug of choice is desmopressin, it is a vasopressin analog. For nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, we will use a low sodium diet along with thiazide diuretics, and protein intake should also be reduced to reduce the solute load. Now, very importantly, the rate of correction. If it is a case of acute hypernatremia, we are suspecting, we need to uh, correct the sodium or we need to lower the sodium by 10 to 12 milliequivalent per liter 
per day, not more than that. If it is a case of chronic hyponatremia, the rate should be a little slow. So, in cases of chronic hyponatremia, we can uh, we should correct up to 5 to 8 milliequivalent per liter per day, not more than that. Our usual target of serum sodium is 140 milliequivalent per liter. Now, let's see how to calculate the rate of infusion for a particular infusion. It is almost like hyponatremia. I have already discussed in my previous class about hyponatremia, correction of hyponatremia. So, uh, change in serum sodium from 1 liter of infused fluid, that is delta sodium, can be calculated by sodium in the infused minus serum sodium divided by total body water plus 1. Now, for total body water, we know that hypernatremia is a volume contracted state. So, total body water will be 50% of lean weight in male, whereas normally it is 60% of the lean weight. And in case of female, it will be 40% of the lean weight, whereas normally it is 50% of the lean weight. Okay. So, this change is because of the volume contracted state. Now, I will take an example uh, and it will be easy to understand. Suppose a 70 kg male has presented to us with a serum sodium level of 164 and the patient has presented with seizure. That means the patient is acutely symptomatic. So, we need to do uh, the correction of hypernatremia. So, if we are using a 5% dextrose, that is hypotonic solution to correct the hypernatremia, what will be the rate of infusion? The change of serum sodium level by 1 liter of 5% dextrose, we can calculate like this. We have already seen the formula. The sodium level in the infused, 5% dextrose contains 0 sodium, so it is 0 minus patient's serum sodium that is 164 divided by total body weight this is patient total body water this is total body water body weight multiplied by 0.5 plus 1 so ultimate result is 4 milliequivalent that means 1 liter of 5% dextrose will reduce serum sodium by 4 milliequivalent so to reduce 12 milliequivalent of serum sodium we will require 3 liter of 5% dextrose that means in 24 hours we can give 3 liters of 5% dextrose because we have seen that in 24 hour maximum we can correct 12 milliequivalent so 3 liter 5% dextrose to be given over 24 hours for a correction of 12 milliequivalent of serum sodium so the per hour we will need to infuse 125 ml okay this we get from this formula okay 3 liter in 24 hours so per hour it will be 125 ml okay so this is how we calculate the rate of infusion for a particular infusate okay not very difficult plus we always need to remember that we need to give fluid to correct the ongoing loss also and the ongoing loss may be due to loss from the GI tract or maybe insensible loss from skin or respiratory tract and it may amount for up to 1.5 liter a day so we should keep this is this also in mind while correcting the hypernatremia so this is all about the hypernatremia I wanted to discuss I hope this class was useful to you